and welcome to Module 6. This module will be focused on legal issues in the context of public libraries, and we're going to talk about two legal issues, the privacy rights of patrons and accessibility. Now both of these impact all information institutions, but arguably the public library presents a very interesting setting for these issues for basically two reasons. The tension between the right to privacy within a public sphere and the diverse user base of public libraries and the need to make their spaces, services, and resources available to individuals with an entire range of backgrounds and abilities. So the first is a perpetual debate, and the second makes an understanding of accessibility very important. We'll also touch on the Fourth Amendment because in the broader context in which privacy rights need to be understood, and I'll also talk a little bit about uh, the American Library Association policies and guidance in this area, specifically with respect to law enforcement requests for patron information. And then just as a note, I have two previews for you. Uh, within the module resources, you'll find a recorded lecture from Jonathan Lazar, considered to be a true expert in the area of accessibility. And the module scenario question is focused on the issue of law enforcement requests. Let's get started. <clears throat> so here's the agenda. It gives you a preview of what I'll be covering in a bit more detail for your context. And we'll go ahead and start things off with the context of privacy rights. So our discussion of privacy always starts with the Constitution of the United States of America, and specifically the Fourth Amendment. Now, on the slide, you see the text of the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and maybe you've thought about this before, or maybe you haven't. But it's important to recognize that we do not see an explicit mention of a right to privacy. It's just not there. That said, uh, the framers of the Constitution had an overarching goal that has been said by uh, many to be one of protecting the people's right to privacy and freedom from unreasonable intrusions by the government. Now, there are other parts of the Bill of Rights that are also germane to privacy rights. For example, the First Amendment and the right to association, the Third Amendment uh, and the right not to quarter soldiers in your home, and the Fifth Amendment uh, guaranteeing uh, a right against self-incrimination. Uh, perhaps even more important, though, in terms of where we are today, is the fact that over the last 50 to 60 years, uh, the Supreme Court has treated these different provisions of the Bill of Rights uh, by reading them together and thus implying the existence of what has been called zones of privacy. Uh, still, there is the fact that there is no part of the Constitution that explicitly states that we have a right to privacy. And that means that the courts and legislatures uh, have defined the scope of these zones of privacy. Uh, now, what that all means, basically, is that we have some big gaps in this area. Uh, and at least in the United States, unlike other countries, uh, we have not passed a comprehensive privacy protection law. Now, to be clear, that is not to say that we don't have privacy laws, because we do, uh, but that's part of the problem. Uh, these other laws tend to focus on uh, more specific protections. So let's start then with the landmark legislation known as the Privacy Act of 1974. So perhaps the broadest of U.S. laws, the Privacy Act of uh, 1974, established protection standards uh, for the collection, use, and management of personal information by federal government agencies. Now that sounds pretty good, uh, but as an example of the specificity that I mentioned a moment ago, <clears throat> excuse me, 
The Privacy Act of 1974 doesn't include certain parts of the federal government, for example, the intelligence community, and it doesn't extend to state, local, or tribal governments, nor does it include corporations or any other non-governmental organizations. So when you look at it in that context, you see that even though it's a very broad law, even though it's a landmark piece of legislation, it certainly doesn't provide a comprehensive right to privacy. There are other examples. Um, now, these tend to be more specific laws uh, in the area of consumer protection. Uh, for example, the Driver's Privacy Protection Act of 1994 uh, governs the privacy and disclosure of personal information gathered by state departments of motor vehicles. There's also the Video Privacy Protection Act, also known as Public Law 10618, designed to prevent the wrongful disclosure of videotape rental or sale records uh, or similar audiovisual materials. So again, those two uh, consumer protection laws do provide uh, specific rights to privacy, but in a very narrow uh, scope. So um, they also are relatively unconnected to one another. <clears throat> and then adding to this lack of cohesiveness, there really is no single government agency with a mandate to monitor or protect privacy. Excuse me. So instead, these laws fall within the oversight and administration of a patchwork of federal agencies. And that means that many agencies play a role in protecting different types of information. But there's really no broad over, uh, overarching structure that helps us understand the full scope of our privacy rights, at least in the United States. <clears throat> and so at the end of the day, our federal government has provided unclear ground upon which to base our understanding of privacy rights. Uh, and that's uh, a natural segue then to state privacy laws. So when we talk about state privacy laws, we do get some additional guidance uh, from various state laws regarding the privacy of library records specifically. Uh, we can say that 48 states in the District of Columbia, uh, according to the American Library Association, have laws protecting the, confidenti uh, um, sorry, the confidentiality of library records. <clears throat> Got a little uh, tickle in my throat. <clears throat> now, this information I'm sharing with you, these statistics are based upon um, the last update to the ALA's website, which occurred in November 2021. So we're almost coming up on two years. And believe it or not, there has been uh, quite a bit of legislative activity in that two-year period. <clears throat> but at least at that time, two states, Hawaii and Kentucky, uh, had uh, attorney general's opinions protecting library users' privacy. Uh, and also at that time, five states had enacted their own privacy laws, that being California, <clears throat> Connecticut, Colorado, Utah, and Virginia. And um, it shouldn't come as any surprise to us that those laws are all modeled after the European General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR. Uh, and so we're kind of seeing this uh, consensus building and this momentum that's pushing uh, the United States slowly but surely to its own comprehensive privacy uh, protection statute. But we're not there yet. Now, we did uh, learn about Attorney General's opinions uh, during our searching for uh, legal information exercise assignment. <clears throat> now, the language of laws and attorney general opinions obviously vary from state to state. So, again, it's certainly not comprehensive or consistent. Um, and you'll find that some of the uh, opinions and laws are, are complete and concise. Some are so brief that you really can't glean a lot from them. Uh, and there may or may not be uh, court opinions that interpret corresponding statutes to provide more information about what the law permits or prohibits. Um, and so although we do have a different uh, situation at the federal level, 
it still comes down to a patchwork of laws and opinions, doesn't it? Uh, and what is the same, though, is we come away with a not very clear idea, particularly across multiple state jurisdictions, regarding the privacy rights of library patrons. Now, what we can say uh, with a relative assurance is that the majority of laws um, have declared that a library user's records and information uh, are confidential and are not subject to disclosure, uh, with some caveats uh, regarding uh, certain conditions that typically come down to user consent or court order. Uh, so let's talk a little bit then about the Library Bill of Rights. <clears throat> now I have in parens privacy, uh, and this th is the American Library Association's Bill of Rights. Excuse me again. Now as we've talked about in this class, the broad and often vague language that we find in laws doesn't always help a whole lot when it comes to figuring out how we should act in any given situation. Um, neither the Constitution nor the framework of federal and state laws really help much either with understanding what privacy rights look like in the library. Uh, but the ALA uh, Library Bill of Rights does explicitly state in my red call-out box there, uh, you know, certain uh, precepts about the confidentiality in library use. And again, so it's a pretty broad statement in and of itself. Uh, and while it may not be all that helpful from a legal perspective, uh, it definitely does establish that there is a right to privacy. Uh, but again, if you look at the additional guidance that the uh, ALA has provided, you will find some information that uh, I guarantee you will be helpful. So, <clears throat> first, uh, I think what we need to acknowledge is that uh, in a library, whether it's physical or virtual, uh, the right to privacy, according to the ALA, is the right to open inquiry without having the subject of one's interest examined or scrutinized by others. I want to let that sink in for a moment. Now, that represents a really important connection to the First Amendment, right, from the Bill of Rights, uh, and our right to free expression, which is something that the ALA defends uh, on our behalf as one of their guiding principles. Now, the second bullet point on the slide establishes that in all areas of librarianship, uh, best practice leaves the user in control of as many of their choices as possible. Uh, and that includes user decisions about the selection of access to and the use of information. Now, we also know that the lack of privacy and confidentiality can lead to a chilling effect on a user's choices. So it's important that all users do have that right to be free from any unreasonable intrusion into or surveillance of their lawful library use. So now we need to discuss a little bit further about confidentiality. <clears throat> now the ALA uh, includes that in their Bill of Rights. I'll let you look at that uh, on the on the slide uh, in front of you. But I, I want to digress a bit to cover confidentiality in the context of information security. Confidentiality forms one of the components we know as uh, what's commonly been uh, termed the CIA triad. And that's CIA with hyphens between the letters. Uh, the other two being integrity and availability. So confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, in the context of information security, confidenti confidentiality are the things that we do to protect sensitive information. So confidentiality ensures that only authorized users can access sensitive information. Makes sense, right? And we protect this sensitive data using things like strong encryption uh, by training uh, uh, our 
personnel who handle that sensitive information by following good cyber uh, hygiene uh, policies, securing our documents appropriately with mechanisms other than encryption, uh, by ensuring our data storage is viable and employing things like information classification. Now, privacy uh, is considered a subset of confidentiality. And basically what that means is that I have the right to keep information about myself to myself and not to be forced to share it with others, nor others sharing my information without my consent. Uh, excuse me again for a drink. My throat's uh, really scratchy today. So in this context, then, we can say that confidentiality means that <clears throat> if I do choose to share my personal information, I have an expectation that it won't be reshared without my knowing consent. Now, uh, maybe you've thought about this when you're asked to share your private data with, on with an online retailer or a credit agency or when completing a job application. Where does your sens sensitive information go? Are they protecting it uh, in, in the ways that I enumerated a moment ago? And this also kind of reminds me of a quote attributed to uh, Sun Microsystems, a corporation that long, no longer exists, by its then uh, Chief Executive Officer Scott McNeely. And this goes all the way back to 1999, uh, speaking about consumer privacy. At that time, McNeely said, and this is pretty famous in the industry, you have zero privacy anyway, get over it. You have zero privacy anyway, get over it. Now think about the fact that McNeely recognized that almost 25 years ago, uh, privacy in this country is almost uh, an emperor with no clothes situation. And it really doesn't help that cyber criminals are out there. They want your sensitive data because it's valuable to them. Uh, I mean, that serves the entire foundation for ransomware uh, intrusions that we see that become such a scourge of so many sectors uh, of our economy. Uh, so bringing it back to uh, uh, libraries here, um, we shouldn't collect information from our patrons without justification. Uh, we have to have some reason, regardless of the technology used, and everyone who collects or accesses PII, privately, uh, private, uh, I, personally identifiable information, excuse me, in any format, has a legal and ethical obligation to protect the confidentiality of that information. All right. Uh, and so we can say that if we're going to collect uh, this information or gather it in any way, and we're going to store it, then we need to take the necessary measures to ensure that that information goes no further. Uh, now that leads us to some of the sticky situations that can arise with law enforcement. <clears throat> now, uh, sorry about that. Law enforcement agencies and officers uh, may occasionally believe that library records contain information that would be helpful uh, to their investigation of criminal activity. Now, thankfully, the American judicial system provides a mechanism uh, for seeking the release uh, of confidential information or records, uh, and that is a court order must be granted following some show of good cause based on specific facts presented to a court holding jurisdiction over the information uh, storage area or uh, that organization. Now, if a library is subject to a court order, they should make the records available only in response to properly executed court orders. That's kind of the framework in which we operate. And so it's just not enough for uh, the police or other law enforcement officials to show up to your library, flash a badge, and demand that you give them information. 
there has to be a court order based on a showing of good cause in the proper jurisdiction. Uh, and that's good because that means there are clear standards that law enforcement must adhere to. Now, ideally, that would always be the case, right? But in real life, sometimes law enforcement officials uh, may rely on the fact that library staff don't know that there needs to be a court order to request information. Uh, maybe some ethical lines get crossed, uh, even, with, uh, even with the good intentions of catching the bad guys, right? So we do have to be careful in that regard. Now, <clears throat> if you think about it, this is really not altogether different from uh, people who are willing to let a cop search their car when they've been pulled over, even though they can't be legally compelled to do so. There has to be some form of probable cause, but not everyone is aware of that, or perhaps they're intimidated by the, uh, the police, uh, you know, in front of them. Uh, it kind of goes along the lines of the argument I've heard about privacy in general, uh, in that, uh, hey, you know, I don't have anything to hide, so of course I'm going to allow the police to form a search. And I would tell you that that is a slippery slope. Uh, there's a reason I shut the door to my bedroom. I'm not doing anything wrong, but that doesn't mean I want to be careless with my privacy either. I value that. So still, when a law enforcement official asks you for something, you probably do want to be helpful, right? It's human nature. Uh, and that can make it challenging to assert your rights. Uh, now, as information professionals, we can approach a situation with the best of intentions and still end up giving information to law enforcement that is actually in contravention of the commitment to our patrons. Uh, and so that's what we have to guard against, right? Now, um, let's look a little further and see what the American Library Association has to say about personally identifiable information. All right, so in addition to the ALA's Library Bill of Rights, uh, I also wanted to draw your attention to uh, ALA policies focusing on more specific areas of privacy and confidentiality. And I've placed some bullets, uh, boiled down bullets of, uh, of that uh, policy on the slide uh, in front of you there. Now, I do want to do a little backstopping here. So, um, depending upon uh, how old you are, if you're like me and you're as old as dirt, um, you have a direct memory of this. But, uh, you know, back in uh, 2001, so 22 years ago, uh, right after 911, uh, we went through a pretty unsettling period of time uh, where law enforcement officials we're giving uh, a pretty wide berth to request information uh, from all organizations, including libraries, uh, using the Patriot Act and other legislation uh, at the time. Not all of that legislation is still extant, by the way. Uh, and, you know, to give it proper context, we had just lived through uh, arguably one of the most serious attacks on our country. And many of us were very concerned about our national security. Uh, as uh, a former military member myself and a federal government employee for many years, uh, you know, I was I was living uh, that concern about national security on a daily basis. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I don't want to downplay the fact that national security is important, but uh, you know, there's a balance between the two, and if you will. Right after 911, given that serious situation, the pendulum had swung decidedly towards national security. Now, um, law enforcement helped, uh, or the national security laws rather, helped law enforcement to justify uh, many search activities. Uh, they certainly were more significantly extensive than what we had been um, used to in the past, the norm. Uh, and so uh, I think it's safe for us to say that this caused quite a bit of turmoil 
uh, in the library community um, as well as others. Uh, and for a number of years following that, we struggled with trying to figure out what the right balance was between protecting national security, but also protecting individual liberties. Now, the ALA definitely came down the side of not losing sight of how important it is to protect our patrons' individual liberties. Uh, and that's what these bullets from the policy on the slide reflect. Now, um, one of the things I do like about their policy is they talk about how libraries form one of the great bulwarks of democracy. Uh, and that libraries are a living embodiment of the First Amendment. Uh, and that the collections that libraries present to patrons include both voices of dissent and voices of the majority. Uh, and so we do have to be careful if we start to make people feel as if they're under surveillance in a library. Not only is that a violation of, uh, you know, user privacy, but you're also stifling their freedom to associate um, and freely express their views and opinions. Uh, and uh, certainly reading is one form of expression. Uh, and so what we have then uh, is the ALA and uh, other people in the library community that were very concerned about throwing around the cause of national security and eroding individual liberties following 911. Now, uh, in the intervening couple of decades, a lot of libraries uh, began putting into place their own policies that restricted how much PII they collected. Uh, you know, just as, uh, you know, a kind of a ground level set there, let's not collect as much in the first place. Uh, and then policies that uh, also guided uh, decision making in the area of PII. Now, it's unlikely that uh, we can get away with not collecting information at all. We could minimize it. So uh, for that information that we do collect, how long do we really need to keep it, right? So uh, data retention is a, a huge issue. Uh, and it's not just about privacy. It's, it's about resources, right? Uh, there is uh, just a, a, an explosion of information and data uh, in the past couple of decades, and that requires space and, um, you know, administration and electricity and everything else that goes into data storage, right? Uh, now, a lot of the guidance that you'll see out there from a legal perspective or a regulation viewpoint, really just common sense here, is that collect as little as you need and then keep it for the shortest amount of time possible. Now, <clears throat> some of the uh, regulatory and compliance directives that uh, I deal with on a daily basis, uh, you know, in the information security sector uh, is uh, the fact that um, we have pretty much standardized approach to data retention, right? Most of the time, what you find in the various information security frameworks is that you need to retain one year's worth of data. Uh, and then some organizations will uh, uh, go um, one step further uh, and, you know, they'll either add three months or six months on uh, of uh, data in some kind of a cold storage format, maybe like, um, you know, a glacier. Uh, storage on AWS cloud or, you know, magnetic tape stored off site, uh, locked away in a building, things of that nature, right? So that's been well established by these various frameworks. Excuse me. Now, keep, uh, collect as little information as you need. Keep it for the shortest amount of time possible. Now, what about law enforcement inquiries? Well, um, ALA does provide an overview of what the various laws say. And uh, again, I've provided some of that on the slide uh, in front of you. 
Uh, and this is important to us because uh, it provides librarians with reassurance and, excuse me, also accomplishes a couple of other things. First, uh, increasing awareness about what uh, your rights and responsibilities as librarians are. And second, by providing awareness, uh, librarians can and should stand their ground. Uh, and so it's not just about what the law says, obviously that's important, but it's also about the ethically right thing to do. And, uh, and so even if someone uh, makes them feel as though they're doing the wrong thing when they deny a request, and I stumbled on the words there a little bit, but so if a law enforcement official were to make you feel as if you're doing the wrong thing by denying a request, uh, then the ALA's explicit guidance does provide uh, somewhat of a higher level reassurance that you are doing the right thing. Uh, now, if you look at documents and policies that are promulgated by other library associations, um, you'll find similar guidance and uh, clearly reflected in these policies uh, and particularly code of ethics of our professional uh, associations. Uh, and so there is a consensus that's been built. Now, uh, how can we respond to law enforcement requests for information? Uh, here, uh, the ALA talks about um, some fundamental principles that we should adhere to or keep in mind uh, when we're responding to requests from law enforcement and some explicit guidance on what you can do. Uh, now, what this all comes down to is asking for identification, consulting legal counsel, uh, getting top cover from your leadership, uh, don't make disclosure decisions on your own, uh, and thinking about these scenarios in advance. Uh, if you can do those four or five things, uh, then you will be well postured for when you are confronted with a request, you'll be better composed, you'll have thought through some of this stuff in advance, and you'll be better equipped to uh, stand your ground uh, should that uh, be the need. Now, um, I'm going to move on here. Uh, I do have two slides of takeaways. I'll let you kind of peruse those on your own. Uh, and then I want to close things out with uh, my professor contact in info. Uh, and of course, I am looking forward to our discussions. And I will talk to you all later. Thank you very much.